Hi, I'm Amanda Morrell, Personal Finance Editor with Interest.co.nz, and I'm here today with a special double shot interview. I've got with me Sir um, Ray Avery. He was the 2010 New Zealander of the Year, also voted most recently one of the most trusted men <laughs> in New Zealand as well, and he's just given a very inspirational speech at the New Zealand Institute of Chartered Accountants, and he had some really good advice for some of the um, professionals working in this area trying to inspire and coach along some of their clients. Now, one of the things I'm constantly hearing in New Zealander, I'm in a foreign and this is my observation, is the tall poppy syndrome. And this seems to be a plague of the nation of sorts. And you've said that New Zealanders need to toot their own horn more as a way to achieving greater success. Why do you think that is? Oh, I think it's just um, part of our being our um, kind of Anzac spirit. You know, um, um, countries are born out of history and we don't have a great history of um, communication, I think, in terms of... Uh, it's been much more parochial in the way that we've actually looked at ourselves. So if you've had somebody who has um, uh, got done something really great in an Anzac spirit, gone over the wall and you know killed um, you know the enemy or whatever, um, it, you get a, a little bit of a good on you and pat on the back. But we don't celebrate it. We certainly don't do much media stuff around uh, things that are non-sports, uh, particularly in the area of science. We've got very big companies in New Zealand that. Uh, are doing game-changing technology. Lanzatech is one that's um, you know developed some green technology which can probably revolutionise fossil fuel industry, and it really hasn't been given the coverage or the uh, you know the, the persona that it should do uh, within New Zealand. Um, certainly, it's been picked up uh, almost in a greater level from overseas. So much so that Richard Branson's investing in the company, Chinese companies. Um, but for us. Um, we are still very homely, I think, in the way that we do things. I think Len Brown's trying to do something in terms of making Auckland the innovation hub of um, the South Pacific area, and I think he's on the right track in the sense that what I do know from the media communications industry is the more that you say things, the more that you tell the story, um, then the more people believe it, and then people believe it innately, and then they... It's rather like having a flag um, in the old battles of, um, you know, in the early 16th, 13th century, you always had a flag bearer which led the troops into battle and for us we don't have that I don't think we don't have we don't do that necessarily through icons uh, we do celebrate the odd one like Sir Edmund Hillary but I think generally um, people like Colin Murdoch for instance who arguably made the largest contribution in global health care of any individual in the whole world and is unknown at home you know um, and that's a tragedy and so I talk about Colin every chance I get because I'm sure if enough people uh, get to hear of him, they'll say, yeah, I can do that. What about this argument that it's lack of capital that's holding entrepreneurs back in New Zealand? This is something I'm always coming up against. It said that we simply don't have enough backing or angel investors out there to get people up and off the ground. Uh, well, that's only, I think, probably a half truth in that um, what we know from a demographic of businesses is that we've got approximately 420,000 small businesses which make up the lion's share of all our businesses in New Zealand. What we also know from scientific research overseas and from local research at, at uh, Waikato is that you need a threshold of at least 50 people in a company before R&D can be successfully implemented. You also need a particular population density working in, uh, uh, in the um, innovation sector for innovation to occur osmotically. So for instance, think um, something like Silicon Valley versus Hamilton. And what we've done is we've fragmented all of our innovation centres and they don't necessarily communicate particularly well with each other. So we've got two problems. One is that you can't do R&D and, and certainly investors would be hard pressed to find. One of the things I find when I'm talking with um, NZTE is that they also have the great difficulty in finding the quality of businesses to invest funds in. So it's not necessarily that the funds aren't there, it's just that the ideas behind the businesses aren't there really either, or uh, there's not enough of them. Mm -hmm. And So we need to find another way of changing that, and that's why we've started to work on a website portal called the New Zealand Knowledge Bank. And that's uh, an open source um, vehicle which enables, enables companies to uh, have a knowledge bank deposit which tells you who they are, what they do, uh, and hopefully what we're trying to do is create an artificial community in this particular website. You can go and go through a workshop which and a toolbox which helps you to get your in invention to market, puts you in touch with the right angel investors that are applicable uh, to patent attorneys, 
And so we're hopeful that by trying to get everyone on the same page that we can create an artificial concentration of dialogue. And if we can do that, I think we've got a chance. I don't see any other solution. Um, Andy Hamilton from that Ice House talks about generating uh, 3,000 new companies the size of Fresh and Pike over the next um, two decades. And I struggle to find where they're going to come from, you know, in terms of scalability from the existing raft of companies. I think what we can do is um, have a look inside the CRIs. Uh, we've uh, taken a lot of um, uh, IP from within the CRIs and commercialised it because we know what the customer wants. We find products that are already sitting there, mm -hmm. but there's a big gap between being customer-centric and product-centric. The CRIs develop products and technology, but they don't know who the customer is. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need to change the customer mm -hmm. for the end product. Mm -hmm. In your speech today, you credited um, observation as a really sort of underestimated tool in being able to figure out what customers really need. And you certainly um, say that, uh, credit that with your success. How do people become more observant? Well, first, I think firstly, um, um, in terms of New Zealand companies or CRIs, we, we need to get out more uh, in the sense, you need to get out into the market. Uh, often what getting out for academics means is going to an international conference, meeting with other academics. You actually need to go and live and work a little bit in those countries or find people who have lived and worked in those countries to get a feedback of ecological niches that exist. Um, some companies that have been quite successful have been everything from ice cream companies, which are called Kiwi, Kiwi Ice Cream Company in, in Thailand, and they recognised that people liked the idea of you know pure ice cream from New Zealand, and they built stores, but they labelled them in uh, local language and and had franchises, and so you know you've got to actually go to your market and experiment and play with your market, and listen to the market before you even start making a product, before you even get out of bed. Uh, do it that way around. We're, we've got people that are currently in um, uh, India, Pakistan, running around with a, a picture which has been rendered in different colours for our infant incubator. And we're asking nurses in hospitals to vote the different colour ways on a scale of one to ten. And that tells us a whole lot about what the pic, what it should look like. You know, and some have different cultural things that reflect that. You know, in, in China, red has got a different value than it might have in Nepal. You know. Uh, you've also emphasised the importance of networks, uh, and I imagine getting out is um, sort of an instrumental way to build that. Is there any other um, tips you would have in that area for, for well, would-be entrepreneurs? The networks comes, come out of um, two things. One is uh, going into the developing countries. Those networks unfold, just like somebody coming to New Zealand. Often what happens is uh, somebody says, oh, you should meet Fred or you should meet Frank, and then you, so you get those networking opportunities. I think we're hopeful that the Knowledge Bank will form that portal, both internally and externally. So the, the good thing about the Knowledge Bank is that it can take a communication at the bottom of each Knowledge Bank deposit is a conversation section where you can communicate in up to 50 languages. So somebody can key in Functional Foods New Zealand and they can find this person that they need to talk to and have a conversation. And that's great because you can't currently do that. It's very hard to find the technology capacities that you want to find in New Zealand. Um, I really appreciated your last message, and that was, if you do good, you'll attract good to yourself, and it seems like a spiritual new age kind of cheesy thing, but you've certainly um, come across that yourself personally and found that it's worked. I think that um, oh, the reason we also get some, uh, well, since uh, uh, the largest percentage of support we get for our work is from donations of goods in kind, and that can be patent attorneys or, or uh, computer-aided design companies or media companies donating their time because I think they recognise that just like giving a, a charitable donation, that being seen to be good is a good thing. It gives clients a belief that um, they do have a heart. Mm -hmm. And so I think that uh, perhaps the future of businesses, if we could make the future of businesses um, much more uh, social entrepreneurial, that we'd have a much better planet, um, make products that are good for us and our, and our, and our people uh, and our planet, um, it would be great. Um, you know, instead of... Um, you know, looking at the bottom line. There's a lot of intangibles in business, and I've tried both. I've made a bit of money, and it didn't bring me necessarily the great happiness that I thought it would do, but I've had immense wealth and happiness through uh, doing good um, and encouraging others to do good. You know, it sounds a bit evangelical, but um, uh, it's, uh, it's a good thing. To, it makes you feel good. Now, you counted uh, how many days you reckon you have less, left on this earth. Was it well, 7,000? Yeah, I budgeted for 7,000, and, and that's, um, 
you know, if I, I was having some of my Greek relatives over the other day and that they're looking at being 100, so that would change the numbers, but I'm always very cautious. And if I get to 7,000 and, and nobody's turned the timer off, I may just reset it. <laughs> How do you wish to spend those last <laughs> 7,000 oh, I am now, so I am now. I steal time to, uh, I recognise that, um, I'm really it's just a metaphor for making sure you don't waste time. Uh, I don't think that I wasted time uh, in learning the skills that I did uh, through the, the years that I spent in different industries and so on. But now I think I can make them much more holistic. And uh, you know, if I concentrate on certain outcomes and make sure I don't waste time and communicate with people. And sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's rather like a baton. Um, you don't, the reason I do these talks is because you just don't know. You might motivate somebody in that audience to take up the challenge and do something which goes on to change the world comes another Ray Avery, so that's why I do it. Well, let's hope that's the case here today. <laughs> Ray Avery, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Amanda Morell with interest.co.nz, and this has been a special double-shot interview.